Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me at the St. Louis Science Center. This is my first time here, so you're really lucky to have such an amazing science center. Um, I actually am from Los Angeles in California, and so my background is I'm an aerospace engineer by training. I don't have kids, actually. I have cats, <laughs> but I'm talking to you. But so for those of you here in the audience, you recognize the rover in the background here? It's Curiosity, right? And so you've got an exhibit um, upstairs, I believe, in your museum on the Curiosity rover. So I actually worked on the Curiosity rover entry, descent, and landing team. And I think you guys have seen the video, Seven Minutes of Terror, but I'll probably play it again. Um, but my other job is as a research professor, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background on me because when I was your age, I was trying to decide what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I had to decide if I wanted to be a scientist, an engineer, a doctor, a veterinarian, and I ended up choosing engineering. But ever since since I was about your age, I actually knew that I wanted to work for the space program. And the reason for that is because I loved science fiction. Do any of you like science fiction by a show of hands? Star Wars? Star Trek? <laughs> Doctor Who? <laughs> the Expanse? And so when I was a little kid, I actually used to watch Star Trek with my dad at home. And I was enthralled and fascinated by the idea that there are alien planets, alien worlds, and potentially alien civilizations out there. So that's the reason why I became an engineer. Um, but over the course of my career, I've also done other things which I find enjoyable. I'm a pilot. Jen, if you want to be a pilot and fly airplanes, it's a lot of fun, <laughs> so think about it. Um, I ride motorcycles, so that's also a lot of fun. And so part of my things that I like to do is involving technology in what it is that I do. Um, so I actually was not born in the United States. I was born in the United Kingdom, and I immigrated here when I was three years of age uh, with my family. And we came to the US because the US had a lot of amazing job opportunities. And my dad was an engineer too, and he was able to get a good job as an engineer. But I spent my entire career here. Um, I got my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD in aerospace engineering. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But for 16 years, which is a very long time, I worked for NASA. So you guys know about NASA. I think some of you are working NASA t-shirts. Um, I had an opportunity to work on a range of different missions. Are any of you familiar with the Dawn mission? Um, it's a good one. You guys should look it up in your science programs. It actually is in the main asteroid belt. So you know where Mars is. Just beyond Mars is the main asteroid belt, where there's a lot of small asteroids floating around. And we sent a spacecraft there to explore those asteroids and understand basically how they evolved, how they came to be. And so my part in that mission was developing the thrusters, the ion engines that actually got us there. So it's a type of propulsion technology. Um, I then worked on the Mars Curiosity mission for five years, and I worked on the entry, descent, and landing team, specifically the supersonic parachute, and then most recently um, I sent a facility up to the International Space Station, which was a science experiment. And now I'm actually working on the Hyperloop, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but do you guys know the difference between engineers and scientists? By a show of hands? So not everybody does, um, but there's actually a really nice quote that describes the difference between engineers and scientists, is that scientists study the world as it is, and then engineers basically create the world which has never been. So engineers create technology using the tools of math and science. So that's the difference between science and engineering. And I chose to become an engineer because I wanted to create technology, basically to make spacecraft. But my background is actually as an aerospace engineer. Do you guys, by a show hands know what aerospace engineers do? Not so much. <laughs> One or two people in the audience. Well, so aerospace engineers actually design aircraft and they design spacecraft. And so if you become a space engineer like I did, you actually design spacecraft to send vehicles to explore other planets. So this picture back here, this isn't on Earth. This is actually on Titan. Have any of you heard of Titan? You ha so Titan is one of the moons of Saturn. So Saturn is the planet which has the rings around it. And so Saturn has many moons, just like we have a moon. And on the surface of Saturn, there's actually lakes of liquid methane. And we sent a spacecraft to land on that planet, which you can see over here, to take measurements on the surface. So do any of you have a, a grill at home in your backyard where you barbecue things? And so sometimes, you know, there's like a little tank of fuel that powers the grill. There are lakes on methane which are filled with basically that kind of fuel, but in a liquid form. So it's kind of strange and it's kind of crazy. Um, but we were able to send a spacecraft to visit there. And the picture you see on the left is actually on the surface of Titan that was taken by something called the... Yes. <laughs> um, so are any of you familiar with this body, this planet? 
Yes, Europa, excellent. So you guys are space fans. So Europa is part of Jupiter's system. So Jupiter also has many moons, and its most famous moon is Europa, which is known as the ice moon. And so all the red and white lines that you see on the outside of the planet, those are actually cracks in the ice. And so we believe that there is a liquid ocean of water on Europa about 30 miles deep, or between 10 and 30 miles deep, you go through an ice layer, and then you get down to an ocean. So what do you think you might find in the ocean? Fish, right? So in the next 10 years or so, we're going to send a spacecraft to visit Europa and hopefully land on the surface and then drill through the ice to get to the water beneath. And we don't know what we'll find, so it's pretty exciting. Um, so this is something which is also coming up in the space program. And then my personal favorite place in our solar system is Enceladus. Have any of you heard of Enceladus before? You have, see, you guys are excellent uh, uh, students of space exploration. Well, Enceladus is also another moon of the Saturn system. And Enceladus actually has geysers that erupt from the surface of the moon um, and actually go into space. And the little particles in those geysers actually go into Saturn's rings. And they're actually a part of the composition of Saturn's rings. And we sent a spacecraft here, and it orbited for over 10 years, and it actually made measurements of these plumes and found organic content. And organic content means the building blocks of life as we know it. So these are the things that aerospace engineers do uh, for a living. But what I was able to do, which I found quite enjoyable, was working on the Mars Curiosity mission. So we'll play Seven Minutes of Terror, which is a lot of fun. It's a movie that describes the engineering system that we built to send something to the surface of Mars. So I think you're going to have to click into this video. It's like down at the bottom there. One moment. When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. But it still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive or dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as the seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1,600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constrained space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about a thousand miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. A parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9 Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it will only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. 
and that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we gotta cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just gonna smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divert maneuver. We fly off to the side. Diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky cream. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage away to a safe distance from the rover. So that's pretty exciting. And so it's actually the six year anniversary of landing the rover on Mars. So that happened on August 5th of 2012. So it actually happened. <laughs> so it's actually older than a lot of you kids are in the audience, which is kind of interesting, but it is exciting. But so by a show of hands, do you guys recognize the planets that you see here? So on the left is Venus, in the middle is Earth and on the right is Mars. And you know what's so interesting? Is that at the beginning of the formation of our solar system after the planets formed, these three planets were actually very similar to each other in terms of having water on the surface and in terms of having an atmosphere. But something happened over the course of time to turn Venus into a very hot planet where it's you know, over 500 degrees on the surface and then Mars into a very cold planet which is minus 100 degrees on the surface. So basically we can't live on Venus because it's too hot and we can't live on Mars because it's too cold. Exactly. <laughs> it's the Goldilocks planet. And so what that means though, <laughs> so what that means though, I'm going to take questions at the end. So if you can remember your questions and I'll take them, I promise, at the very end, we can answer all your questions. Um, but what's interesting though is that Earth has maintained the same sort of climate so that we can actually live here. And so are you guys familiar with the term climate change? and how the temperature on our planet is changing. Climate change does happen, it happens to other planets as well. And so part of why we explore space is to understand how our own planet might evolve, just like our neighboring planets, like Mars and Earth. Um, Earth. But, oops, uh, I had a double side there. So now these are pictures of Mars. So on the upper left here is, and it is the largest mountain in the solar system. Yes, it is. It's an extinct volcano. And so Olympus Mons is about um, three times as high as Mount Everest, which is quite large. Now this other picture on the bottom here though is very different. It's called Valles Marineris. It's like Mars's version of the Grand Canyon, but it's about six times as deep. So does anyone know what caused uh, the Grand Canyon's formation? Water flowing, sorry, <laughs> flowing on the surface. Um, and so what this means is that at some point in the history of Mars, it did have a lot of water on the surface, but now that water has disappeared, and we'd like to understand where it went, if it's still there in the subsurface, and we do that by sending spacecraft. So by a show of hands, how many people um, think that Mars has moons? Okay, so most of you think we do. it does. Um, so it has Phobos and Deimos. But these are very small moons. And what that means is that they don't have a lot of gravity on them. And because of that, they basically don't turn into a planet. They look more like a strange potato-shaped object. But one of the things that NASA is considering is actually sending spacecraft to go and land on the surface of these moons to set up communication spaces, right? So right now, when we watch satellite television, we use our cell phones, we use satellites. And so you can actually use moons as NASA natural satellites to set up these cute telecommunications bases, for example. So by a show of hands, who thinks we've found water on Mars? Yes. 
Yes. So we actually have in several different places and in several different forms. And so the picture that you see up here is actually beneath the Phoenix lander. So the Phoenix lander landed, I think it was in 2005, it landed closer to the polar regions of the planet. And just beneath the surface, there actually was frozen salt water ice, which you can see that little white patch there, which means that we know there is frozen water in the subsurface on Mars. Um, and then that means that people went to go and visit Mars, you could conceivably tap, tap into that water supply and use it for washing and cooking and cleaning and maybe even drinking if you purified it. Um, so space is a very, very cold temperature. So it's about four degrees Kelvin, which is, oh my gosh, like minus 200 degrees centigrade. So it's too cold for any of us to be able to survive. Mars is a lot better. So Mars gets to a high of 40 degrees um, during the summertime, and it gets to a low of about minus 70 degrees during the wintertime. So it too is too cold for us to survive on. But the real problem with Mars is that the atmosphere is very thin. Um, and the atmosphere doesn't have any oxygen in it, which means we couldn't breathe on the surface of Mars. We'd have to bring our own oxygen supply with us, and we'd have to live in pressurized habitats to be able to survive. So who thinks by a showing hands that there's flowing water on the surface of Mars? <laughs> So let's see if this picture comes up. So there actually is. It's in the form of sort of like a wet mud. And we have a spacecraft which orbits around the planet every single day, Martian day, and it takes pictures of the surface. And so you see the picture here on the left. You see these black streaks coming down the sides of the hillside. We actually have confirmed that this is a wet type of mud, which means that there is water just below the surface on Mars, which when the planet heats up, because it's tilted on its axis, it melts and it comes out of the ground and forms these flows on the surface of the planet. And where there's water, sometimes there's life. So one of the places that we would like to go and explore is one of these places where we see these wet, muddy flows um, and make measurements to see whether or not there's any organic content in that water. So this is a mission, hopefully, that will happen in the near term, in the next you know, five to 10 years or so. And these are some of the additional pictures. But you know what's really exciting is that the discovery of this was actually made by a student a student in college. So what this means is that when you're in college, you as a student can actually determine for the rest of planet Earth what is going on on Mars. And that's a pretty amazing thing, right, to be a part of that. So it is an exciting time. So how many people think we've landed on Mars more than five times? More than seven times? <laughs> and how many people think that NASA is the only space agency that has successfully landed on Mars? It is, actually. So it, it is kind of impressive. Um, so we've landed a whole bunch of times um, on Mars. And so the ones that are coming up are the InSight mission and the Mars 2020 mission. And so we've been landing on Mars since the 1970s, which is you know roughly when I was born and perhaps your parents were born. Um, and so the very first time was the Viking lander. And guess how powerful computers were in the 1970s? Not very powerful at all. So do any of you have cell phones? Do any of you have cell phones by show of hands? And so your cell phone computer is infinitely more powerful than the computers that landed on the surface of the planet. So back then, if you were to compare those types of computers, the cell phone computer would have to occupy almost half the size of this room. So that's how much technology has changed over time. Um, now, this is a picture which shows you different kinds of rovers that have landed on the surface. So the little rover here on the lower left landed in the 1990s. It was called the Sojourner rover, and it kind of looks like a Tonka truck. Do any of you have Tonka trucks? or little trucks that you drive around. <laughs> and then you see the rover up here on the left. This is the Mars Exploration Rover, Spirit and Opportunity, and it's about the size of a lawnmower. So you can get an idea. And you know what's unique about these two rovers is they use solar panels. So do you know what solar panels are? They generate energy from the sun. And so these two rovers that we sent up used solar energy. We moved forward a couple of years, and then we landed the Curiosity rover. You can see how much bigger the Curiosity rover is, right? Exactly. And do you know why that is? Um, the reason why is because you want to carry more scientific equipment. So if you were going to move from one house to another house or move from one apartment to another apartment, you would rent a truck, right? And you would put all your things in the back of the truck, right? Because it's got a big wheelbase. So for the very same reason, if you have a bigger rover, you can carry more scientific equipment. You can make more scientific measurements. But you can see it's basically the size of a small car. And so it's very hard to land something, which is the size of a small car. Um, and so the reason why the Curiosity mission exists is to look for life on the surface, um, or hopefully to look for the building blocks of life on the surface. And there's a whole suite of scientific measurements that do that. Um, so are you familiar with where the Curiosity rover landed on Mars? 
It landed in a place called Gale Crater, which you can see over here. And you can see in the very center of it, there's a big mountain. And on the edge, there's a, a, a ridge. And so we landed basically in a location just inside there. And you can see on this picture here where Curiosity landed is very far away from the other rovers where they landed, which is the Mars Exploration Rovers, for example. So th do you think those two rovers can ever meet each other? Exactly, they're too far apart, sadly, which means that they're exploring different places on the planet to make different kinds of scientific measurements. <laughs> uh, so let's see. So this is another view of Gale Crater where we landed, and so you can see the mountain in the center, and then you can see the ridge line on the edge, and you see the black ellipse, the black circle? That's the region where we landed, and that's where the rover is currently driving around making, yes? <laughs> So um, this, gives you, this gives you a scale of how big downtown Los Angeles is relative to where we landed on Mars. And downtown St. Louis is probably very similar in that sense, in terms of a scale. So do any of you ever play darts or know the game of darts? And you know how the more precise you are, the better you can get to the center? So this is a map of a dart board on the surface of Mars, showing you that over time, we've been able to throw the rover in a more precise way. Um, so basically, back in the 1970s, we had the ability to throw with an accuracy of about 200 miles, which is, I don't know how far that is between, maybe that's the half the difference between um, St. Louis and Kansas City. But now, we've gotten to the point where we can throw that dart, which is the rover, onto Mars with an accuracy of about 12 miles which is much better. That's like from here to the airport, for example, would be another thing. So I'll show you one more video. You might have to click, I think you have to click into this video too. So this actually tells you how you land on the surface of Mars. And I'll walk you through it. So you basically come in at 13,000 miles an hour, right? So that's pretty fast relative to an airplane. It's much faster. It's 50 times as fast as an airplane. Um, then you slow down using aerodynamic drag. You then deploy a really big parachute, which was my portion of the mission. The parachute is so big, it basically takes the entire size of this auditorium to give you enough aerodynamic drag to slow down. At that point, you basically reach terminal velocity. You don't slow down anymore. So you actually cut the parachute off, and then the rover starts to free fall towards the surface, but then it turns on a series of eight engines. And those engines are basically firing towards the ground, slowing you down even more. And so you're going, trying to go from about 200 miles an hour down to a speed of about two miles an hour, which is basically like walking speed, for example. Um, when you get about, I would say, you know, two times the height of this room, you start to lower the rover on a series of ropes or tethers and you continue to send towards the ground. Eventually, when the rover touches the ground on its wheels, it knows that, and those tethers are cut, and that little spacecraft goes off and flies away to the side. So that's how that system landed. And you know the primary principle by which you slow down on Mars? You know when you rub your hands together, what happens? They get warm, right? That's called friction. So friction with the atmosphere actually causes um, you to get very warm, but it also allows you to basically, interacting with the atmosphere allows you to slow down because it creates aerodynamic drag. So another example would be, if you're going down the side of the road and you put your hand out the window, what do you feel on your arm? You feel a force, right? The wind buffeting on your arm, that's aerodynamic drag. So that's actually the primary means by which you can slow down um, a vehicle when it's entering the Martian atmosphere. And so that's a video of how we did it. This is another view of that same system. Um, and so we use a heat shield. So the heat shield protects you from getting too hot. Um, and then we use a parachute to slow you down even further. And then we use engines to get the rest of the way. So this was a very difficult thing to do because guess what? Nobody is driving this system. There's nobody back at Mission Control on Earth with a joystick telling it where to go. All of that is done by the rover autonomously. So it actually has to know where it is, how fast it's going, and when to deploy the next thing to slow down. So that's called autonomy. And so that's a system that we've been using in the space program for quite some time. And that's actually something that we're going to implement here on Earth in terms of self-driving cars very soon. So if we uh, keep on going. So this is one more video, which I think you have to click in as well. And so this is the deployment of the parachute. So this was part of our experimentation. So you see here, the parachute is opening up. It looks like a big jellyfish, right? <laughs> but it's not. It's actually made of nylon. So you, all of you have school bags in the back. The material that it's made out of is a type of nylon. So the parachute is actually made out of a very similar material. And so this actually slows you down. So it's sort of like if you hold an umbrella in the wind, you feel it resisting. That's kind of what a parachute does, is the best explanation. And so this is the team that we worked together on to make this work. So we had a lot of fun out testing in the desert. Um, 
And this is the final rover when it was built. So you probably have a mock-up of the system um, upstairs in the museum, and this was the actual rover. Um, what's unique about this rover, in addition to being so big, is that because its wheels are so large, you're able to actually drive over rocks, really, really big rocks, which means you can go to really interesting places. Um, and it also has a power system which operates off of uh, radioactive uh, material, <laughs> which is different from other power systems that we've used. Um, so. Are you familiar, so you're all familiar with science and chemistry and biology, right? You've seen those kinds of experiments. So you know what the rover is? The rover is actually a robotic biologist, chemist, and geologist. And it carries a series of different instruments to do that kind of science on the surface of the planet. And so one of the most interesting measurements is something called a laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. Are, have you ever played with a laser before or used a laser like a laser pointer? So what that is, it's a powerful beam of light which can heat things up. And so the rover's laser is so strong that if I was the rover and I was firing towards you guys, it would actually burn a hole in your shirt. <laughs> so, and what it does is it does that to a rock, it vaporizes it, and then it creates a signature like a fingerprint, which then tells you what the rock is made out of. And so that's one of the primary ways in which the rover is able to tell you what the surface composition of the soil is um, on the surface of Mars. So how long do you think it takes to get to Mars? More than six months? More than a year? So it's close, it's between seven to nine months, which is basically as long as your school year, right? So if you start school in a couple of weeks, you know, uh, at the end of the school year is how long it would take you to get to Mars. Do you think that's a long time? <laughs> it is a long time. So, um, so that's why when people eventually go to Mars, they will also have to be able to be happy and, and healthy in space for that long period of time. But this is the rocket that we launched on in November of 2011, and about eight months later, we made it to Mars. So you have to click on this video as well. So so this is actual video of the rover looking down towards the surface of Mars when it landed. So what you see there is the heat shield falling away, and the rover is basically you know, on its stomach looking down towards the bottom of Gale Crater. So you see how there's a slightly darker region there? Those are actually ancient volcanic deposits on the surface of Mars, because Mars used to be a very um, active uh, planet in terms of volcanoes erupting and things like that. And you see how the, the image is moving back and forth, like it's swaying to side to side? The reason for that is because the rover is still on the parachute. And so when you're on a parachute, you actually move around like this. And so by getting this kind of video data, you can actually back out the type of motion that the parachute is experiencing. And you, and you see how there's different marks or like sort of pock marks on the ground? Those are from prior impacts with the surface from you know, um, micrometeoroids and those kinds of things because the atmosphere is very thin on Mars. So at this point, we're almost done with the parachute, and then we're gonna start to do that descent on those retro rockets. Remember when you saw that before? The retro rockets start to slow you down. So we're off, moving to the side, flying to the place that we wanna land in Gale Crater, but we're getting closer and closer to the ground because we're still descending. Eventually, that sky crane maneuver is gonna start, um, and you're gonna see the rover's wheel come into view. So right now, you're gonna see the wheel come into view. Um, on the, the lower left-hand side of the image. And so now the sky crane has started, and we're getting closer and closer to the ground, so we're kicking up all this dust and the sand, um, and eventually it lands. And so the very first thing that the rover was instructed to do after it landed was to send a picture of itself back home to Earth so that we knew that it was okay. And so this is the very first picture that we received on the left-hand side. And so I think it looks like a transformer. You guys have seen the movie Transformers before? So it kind of does look like, because it is a robot after all, and it is very successful. And you see in the background of the picture there a mountain? That was the mountain that I showed you before in the center of that crater. So the rover's job is basically to drive from where it started to the foothills of that mountain and collect science data along the way. And it's done that over the course of the past six years. So basically, as long as you've been alive, um, or longer than you've been alive, the rover has been driving, collecting science data, right? So that's a lot of work. It's a hard-working machine. And this actually gives you an idea of, uh, this is the site that we landed on, on the surface of Mars, and it actually looks like Earth, doesn't it? So even though it's another planet, it actually looks like a desert on Earth, for example. So our planets are very similar to each other, even though the conditions are not as hospitable as we'd like them to be. 
It took about five and a half years um, in total. Um, then we tested it for about another year and a half, and then we actually sent it. So I'll, I'll, prob I'll be done with the presentation in just a few minutes, and then I'll start taking your questions. And so this is actually a picture of the parachute as it was descending towards the surface on landing night. So do you remember the spacecraft before that took images of the surface where you could see the water flowing down? Um, we made that spacecraft go to a position so it could take a picture of the rover when it was descending towards the surface on landing night um, six years ago. So that's pretty exciting. Um, these are some of the pictures of the rover driving around. So it carries its own camera, so it can take a picture of its wheels. It can take a picture of what it sees in front of it. Um, and it can even take a selfie of itself, because it has a, a camera that it holds out on its arm, so it's actually able to take a selfie. So um, even robotic people like to do that at the same time. <laughs> so this you may not get. <laughs> Well, some, some of you will get it. The kids may not get it. <laughs> but I am a cat person, so that's kind of funny. And it does use lasers, but there's no cats uh, on the surface of the planet. <laughs> um. <laughs> Okay, so now another really interesting, so remember how I told you that there's a laser on the rover and it burns things up? The picture that you see on the right here, you can see a little hole opening up. That's because the laser has fired and burnt a hole in the rock. And then when it does that, it creates the signature, which you can see here in this graph, which actually tells you the elements within that rock. So there's iron, magnesium, silicon, aluminum, calcium, all of the things that you find here on Earth, we can also find on Mars, which is good, because if we send people there one day, um, they may want to uh, use those resources to help themselves. We also have we also have a weather station. So you know how when you watch the TV, the news every evening, you find out what the weather is going to be in terms of how hot it is. Is it going to rain? It doesn't rain on Mars, but it does have a really big temperature um, a fluctuation, which you can see on the upper right here. And it also has a pretty bad radiation environment. So one of the challenges of sending people to live on the surface of Mars is to do something about the radiation environment. And this is the very first mission where we actually made that measurement. Um, and then another exciting measurement that we've made is um, methane on the surface of the planet. And so methane can only be produced in two ways. It can be produced in a geological decomposition process, or it can be produced in a biological decomposition process. So inside of our, inside of our small intestines, or perhaps large intestines as well, we have bacteria, and those bacteria help to break down our food, and part of what they release is methane. So when you find methane, it could actually be due to an organic source, but could also be due to a geological source. And so we made a very precise measurement of methane coming um, out uh, around the rover on the surface of the planet, which is a very important finding in terms of an organic molecule, which is certainly present in abundance. Um, so what is the future of Mars exploration? So one of the most important things is actually getting larger things to the surface of Mars, something large enough to carry people. So this is a vehicle which is under development um, at NASA Johnson right now, which is the Orion capsule. So it's going to carry you know, between three and six astronauts, and will bring them to places beyond low Earth orbit. It will send them to the moon. It will send them to Mars. Mars, it will send them into interplanetary space. And so one of the key functions of an aerospace engineer now working on the human space program is to make vehicles like this, which can carry more people to interplanetary destinations. And you get an idea of the scale because I was standing in front of it when I visited. Um, so one of the other really important things is how are we going to grow food in space? And so we have to do that, right? Because you can't carry all your food with you if you're going to be on a spacecraft for nine months, which means you probably want to grow some of your food, carry seeds, carry um, nutrients with you. And there's an experiment right now up on the International Space Station called the Veggie Experiment, where they are growing food in space. And food doesn't grow as well in a microgravity environment. So it's important for us to understand how can we improve how it grows so that we can grow food on the journey between um, uh, the Earth and Mars, for example, or perhaps even deeper into space. And so the work going on on the International Space Station is a really important part of that. And another thing which is in the future is that once we land on the surface of the planet, we have to live there, right? So on the surface of Mars, there isn't much oxygen. On the surface of Mars, the atmosphere is very thin. So we have to create habitats which operate in a closed-looped fashion um, so that we use as little water as possible and lose as little water as possible and that we can recycle all of our wastes. So we can recycle all the things so that we can survive in a very inhospitable regime. Um, so one of the things that engineers are working 
working on is the development of habitats on the surface and life support systems on the surface of the planet. And this is actually an experimental station which is operated here on Earth to simulate how you would be able to last for a really long period of time on the surface of Mars. Now, if you got to Mars, wouldn't it be terrible if you couldn't drive around? You'd want a car, right? And so one of the things that you also have to develop is a car-sized ro or human-sized rover so you can drive around and explore um, on the surface of the planet, just like Mark Watney did in um, The Martian. But this is a very sophisticated car because it has to be pressurized, it has to have a life support system, um, it has to have a power system. And so this is more difficult than any of the cars that you and I uh, you know, own um, it to develop. And it has to be done now so that we can facilitate exploration in the future. And then, like, by a show of hands, who would like to live on Mars? Okay, a few of you. <laughs> I'm not sure either. I mean, Earth is pretty nice. I'd like to visit. I probably would like to come back, though. I probably still want to live here. Um, and so the important thing I like to say is that when, when NASA and different space agencies from the world do this kind of research, it's actually done um, for humanity. It's not done for any kind of profit motive, any kind of business. And all of the exploration which is done is done by scientists and engineers. And so if you guys want to go into the space program, all you have to do is study math and science in school, grade school, middle school, high school, and then go into university and pursue a degree in engineering um, or science. And you can also be part of the space program. And this is a really nice book that we recently created, which is the stories of 50 women in space. And uh, I do encourage the school teachers out here to get it for your classrooms because it chronicles the stories of females uh, working on the space program as opposed to maybe the larger history which focuses on men <laughs> working on the space program. And so, and I of course am in the book which is the reason why I know a lot about it and then it was put together by a engineer from ESA um, who basically collected the stories and it's a really nice book so I kind of recommend it. So I think I wanted to wrap up with um, a video of what I'm working on next, and uh, you can play this one, but this is the Hyperloop. It's a new form of transportation, uh, which we'd like to implement. This is something called the Hyperloop, which is a high-speed transportation system which operates inside of a vacuum. So it's actually like a spacecraft on the ground. So it uses an engine to levitate off the ground to defy gravity, you can think of it that way, and then a linear electric motor to accelerate to really fast speeds. And so any of you who have like a, hand, a fan or a, a drill uses a rotational electric motor, an electric car. This is a linear electric motor which basically spreads out that electric motor um, and allows you to go to incredibly fast speeds. And I'm talking speeds faster than an airplane. And so the principle of operation is that the vehicle moves inside of a vacuum tube, which means you remove all the air. So like you create space here on the ground on Earth, and that eliminates aerodynamic drag that we were talking about before, which allows you to go to really fast speeds um, at very low energy consumption. And so basically what you're doing is you're creating an airplane without wings, which is the passenger vehicle, and you're creating a sky, which is the vacuum tube, with very, very little air in it so that you can go incredibly fast. Um, and then because you're going so fast, everything has to be operated autonomously, which means you also have an air traffic control system, uh, which is operating how the pods uh, are spaced relative to each other and where they go. And so this is something that we're implementing in the near future, and we're actually studying it for uh, Missouri, for a route between Kansas City and St. Louis. And so right now, I think it takes you about three to four hours to go between Kansas City and Missouri uh, on a train um, or a bus. This would take you about 30 minutes. So that's how fast it is. So it can go up to 1,000 kilometers per hour or 700 miles an hour. And so now I think I'd like to take questions um, for the rest of the time that I've left. So thank you. <laughs> So how, how, how should we order taking the questions? I'll just pick on anybody or? Okay. Oh, that's a great question. So the International Space Station is about the size of a football field in terms of how much area it occupies with the, with the portions which carry people, with the solar array panels, and with the radiators. Um, in terms of how big it is for the portion that people walk around in, um, I suppose it would probably occupy an area of maybe, um, the size of this room, but spread into little tubes? It's a good question, though. So, <laughs> we have not found organisms yet, but we found all the building blocks of life. So we found um, all the building blocks for uh, uh, basically organic compounds, which is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And we've also found methane, which is an organic compound, which can be produced by organisms, but we have not yet found the organisms. And so that would be kind of the future missions to come is to look for that. 
question. <laughs> So the reason why the, the, the dust in the soil is red on Mars is because it has a lot of iron in it. So you know our blood is red. Our blood has a lot of iron in it. So that red color interacting um, with the atmosphere, I'm sorry, uh, iron interacting with the atmosphere generates that red color. So just like our blood is red, uh, the soil is slightly red on Mars as well. Your question? Does it get direct... Oh, it doesn't get its reddish color from the sun uh, directly, but certainly it's illuminated by the sun. So it re receives solar radiation from the sun, which keeps it warm. And then, um, yeah, so but it, the color actually comes from the iron and the fact that you can see it in visible light. Question? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'll come back to you if you remember. <laughs> okay, yes. I don't think that's happened yet because we haven't, human beings haven't traveled out as far as Jupiter. Uh, but uh, at some point, I think we would love to be able to get out to Jupiter. But the radiation environment around Jupiter is actually very difficult. So that's a real engineering challenge to be able to um, create radiation shielding technology to protect people so they can survive on the journey out to Jupiter and in the Jupiter system. Do you remember now? Okay. <laughs> Oh, how big is a rock? It depends upon how much stuff you're going to carry. So, uh, for example, rockets that launch the Curiosity rover into space um, has a diameter of about four and a half meters, which is like close to 15 feet. So I'm five feet tall, roughly. So three times me is how wide the rocket is in terms of its diameter. Yeah, it's, it's pretty tall. So, I mean, it probably occupies, you know, the length of this building, and it's about three. My, my height times three is how wide it is. That's big, how big it is. So, yes. You, you forgot? Okay. All right, so I'm going to go over here now um, to answer some questions. Okay. Your question? What is in blood? <laughs> so blood, um, I am not a biologist, so I can't tell you everything about it, but it does have um, hemoglobin, uh, which is a type of uh, molecule, and it allows you to carry oxygen, and it allows you to carry nutrients, and then distribute them around your body. But I am probably not the best person to answer all the biological questions, but, um, but it's certainly something that all um, animals have here on Earth as a means of carrying oxygen and nutrients to circulate throughout the body. Um, yes. What's it like in space? It depends. So if you are on the space station, it's a little bit better than being out in space completely. So on the space station, there, you're basically in free fall, so you're in a microgravity environment. So it's like when you go in a swimming pool and you go and you swim underneath the water, how you move around, it's more like that. You're more neutrally buoyant. You kind of float around everywhere. Um, you also are exposed to radiation, which are high energy particles coming from the sun. Um, and so the further you get away from Earth, the more difficult that radiation environment becomes. If you're out side of the space station and you're not in this protective capsule, it's incredibly cold. It's four degrees Kelvin. So it's basically, um, you know, minus, over minus 200 degrees centigrade is what the temperature is. So we couldn't survive out in the vacuum of space. And there's also no air at all. It's basically, it's a vacuum. So we also couldn't survive for that reason. So you have to be in a pressurized environment. You have to have an oxygen supply as a human being to be able to survive in space. Otherwise, there's no air and it's too cold. <laughs> yes. Is it what? I don't understand. Where? It's so it, it actually is probably not so healthy to be in space, which is the reason why the astronauts have to spend a lot of time exercising and why they're constantly making measurements of how they're doing, like how is their immune system doing, how is their bone density doing. So because it's so different from Earth, uh, because it doesn't have gravity when you're up in space um, in the traditional way, and, uh, and because you're exposed to radiation, it's actually worse for your body. So you have to be very healthy to go up into space for that reason. All right, your question? <laughs> 
How hot is the sun? Oh my gosh. I mean, it depends upon what layer in the sun, but I think at the surface, it's uh, I don't, like maybe 5,000 degrees. So it's really, really hot. <laughs> so um, and because it's so hot, it's generating um, radiation, and that radiation comes back to us here on Earth. And we actually, plants use that to create, um, to grow themselves. And then we eat the plants, and then animals eat the plants, and then some of us eat the animals. <laughs> uh, any, I, I think I've got your question already. Did I get your question from you yet? Um, I forget. Well, you want another one? <laughs> oh, yeah, we had a mission to Pluto um, that arrived, I guess it was in 2017, called New Horizons, and it did a flyby past Pluto, and we found Pluto was nothing like we thought it was going to be. It actually has a little bit of an atmosphere, um, and it has really interesting surface dynamics going on. And so that spacecraft, New Horizons, has now gone past Pluto at really fast speeds, and now is going into something called the Oort cloud, and we'll make even more measurements of other bodies that are on the edge of our solar system. So it's pretty neat. <laughs> Another question? How big is space? So that, that's a really hard question to answer because the universe um, is actually expanding. Um, so I don't know that there's necessarily a limit to it, um, but it's, it's larger than any of us will ever be able to travel. So it's almost infinite in that sense. Although there probably is a limit to it, but um, <laughs> question? Well, so the Hyperloop is going to be, it depends upon where you're going. So if you're making a, a trip between um, Kansas City and St. Louis, I don't know, is that 200 miles or something like that? Or? It's something like 200 miles. So that, that particular journey would be 200 miles. If we made one between Los Angeles and San Francisco, that would be closer to 350 miles. But it can be as long as about um, 700 miles in length. So you could connect um, you know, major cities and then go to another location. So at that point, you kind of have to regenerate your power cells, your battery cells, and then go on to the next destination. But there's nothing about the system that doesn't allow you to have a network all around the country, for example. There's just a limit to how long you can operate on a single charge, and then you have to recharge and then go to the next station. You have a question? Are you also going to make the Hyperloop um, So, I mean, we would love to be able to have um, a Hyperloop Nepic all across the United States. So then it would go for, you know, a couple of thousand miles in length. Um, but you kind of have to start with something small. So, like, if you're building a road, you'll start with um, your starting point um, out and then you keep on expanding it over time. So it just takes time to be able to build out the system, um, but it only becomes a useful uh, system in terms of operating a vacuum at around 40 to 50 kilometers. So certainly the first route that we build will be at least 50 kilometers, which is, you know, like 30 miles or so. Uh, more questions? Who didn't ask a question? You didn't ask a question before, I don't think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I'll get you in a second. You have a question or? You forgot. We'll get your question then. <laughs> So uh, we believe that it's a storm. So just like um, you can see storm systems that form here on Earth and you get hurricanes and that's a little swirly pattern, it's a similar thing to that, but it's made up of different gases. And then Jupiter is also has an incredibly strong magnetic field, so a lot of its motions are affected by its strong magnetic field. But that itself, we believe, is, to be, is a storm, like a hurricane on Jupiter, in that sense. Um, I didn't get... I'll get these two guys, then I'll get you. <laughs> you... <laughs> How big is, it depends how, the parachute can be a whole range of sizes, but the parachute that we deployed for Mars was about as big as this room. And the reason why it had to be so big, even the rover is so small, is because the atmosphere is so thin. But if you were to go and jump out of an airplane, the parachute would probably be only about as big as the portion of that wall there. So it depends upon how much aerodynamic drag you need, how heavy you are, and how thick the atmosphere is. In, in the back? We haven't yet, um, unfortunately, um, but we're still looking. Uh, and there's something called the SETI program where they're actually making measurements of uh, you know, radio waves coming in throughout the solar system, throughout the galaxy, basically looking to see if anybody else is generating anything. Um, but what we have found is organic material, which is the building block as life as we know it. So methane is an organic compound, which we found on Mars. And also um, in the plumes of the geysers on Enceladus, uh, we also found organic content. So we found the building blocks of life, but we haven't yet found an organism. One more, and then the gentleman back there. <laughs> 
I have not met him personally because he's not part of our company. And so our company, um, we do have many people who actually used to work at SpaceX at our company, uh, but I have not met Elon Musk. So Richard Branson is actually the chairman of the board of our company. And so it's, yeah, <laughs> there's lots of people who are uh, very diversified, right, in terms of their business models. And so Richard Branson has Virgin Group. And so he's got airplanes. He has a space plane, Virgin Galactic. He has trains in the UK. Um, and then now he has Hyperloop um, in Los Angeles. And so he recently joined the board of our company, and he's a he's a great leader um, and person to associate himself with our company. So we're happy about that. <laughs> so, thank you for coming.